dear friends, happy Sunday to you all. I welcome you once again to another episode of Sunday Reflections with Father Evaristus Abu. Today is the fourth Sunday in ordinary time. Many have often asked a question. Can the devil go to church? But the question we are going to ask ourselves today is, what is the devil doing in church? Our gospel passage today is a direct continuation of that of last Sunday. Jesus is at the beginning of his public ministry. He sets out to fulfill his prophetic mandate, to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. From last Sunday's readings, we heard Jesus proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God's kingdom at hand, the message of repentance, and the call of the fishermen. Today, Jesus is at the synagogue where he meets persons held captive by ignorance, demonic possession, and false religion. When we reflect on this passage, as well as other readings of today, we cannot but notice some very vital lessons. Number one, the church is home to both saints and sinners. Yes, even possessed persons do come to church. The devil goes to church. One of the accusations against Jesus by Jewish authorities was his open association with those considered sinners, such as the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and their friends. Jesus often responded by saying, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Confer Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Luke chapter 5, verse 32. Jesus even gave a parable that before trying to remove the speck in someone's eye, we should first take out the log in our own eyes. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 to 5. While the religious leaders were pointing fingers at Jesus, they were so blind to realize their faults, not to mention that in their midst were persons who were possessed by demonic spirits. Just as everyone at the synagogue was shocked by the display of the demon-possessed man, it will surprise you to realize that even today, there are many demon-possessed persons in our congregation, among the lay faithful, among consecrated persons, and even among the clergy. To assume that everyone you see well-dressed and seated calmly in church is perfect and holy is to forget that Jesus Christ said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Demonic possession does not show in a person's face. But as Jesus would say, you will know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7 verse 16. To assume that everyone who is a leader in a church assembly or who performs signs and wonders or makes prophetic utterances is truly from God is one great mistake. In today's first reading, God, speaking through Moses, warns us, us of false prophets that would come telling lies and claiming to be who they are not. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 20. That is to say, as far back as the time of Moses, there were already false prophets. There were already people claiming to speak for God. Meanwhile, they are not for God. So how much more even today? The truth is that there are many of such prophets. And it is not so easy to tell the wheat from the weeds. Confer Matthew chapter 13 verse 25 to 30. The church 
is home to both saints and sinners. Pope Francis once described the church as a field hospital. And like any hospital you go in, you find the nurses, you find doctors, uh, you find all kinds of uh, healers, uh, all kinds of professionals, and you also find all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And you also find family members of those who have accompanied their loved one who is sick to the hospital. That is just how the church is. And we cannot say uh, just because there are evil people in the church, so therefore the entire church is evil. <laughs> one of the mark of the Catholic Church, or one of the mark of the church, is that the church is holy. And we we'll tell people the church is holy. They say, ah, but there are sinners in the church. Yes, there are sinners in the church. The church is holy, not because there are no sinners, but because the church belongs to Christ. And Christ welcomes both saints and sinners. Yes, the devil can go to church. The next question is, the second point of today, what is the devil doing in church? This question, which readily comes, the, the, the next question which readily comes to mind is, if someone knows he or she is not clean, that is, that he or she is a witch, belongs to a sacred cult, partake in human sacrifices and rituals, what would such a person be doing in the house of God? Two reasons readily come to mind. Number one, to steal and kill and destroy. Confer John chapter 10, verse 10. One who is possessed will go to church to steal. He will go to church to kill, to kill the faith, or to destroy fellow Christians by distracting the flow of worship in the church. Indecent dressing, noise making, use of phone, quarreling, gossiping, and so on. Sometimes even by outright spiritual attacks. You know, I, I, I had an experience some time ago as a seminarian. I was seated in the congregation and somebody seated beside me was pressing his phone, watching movies, and not just any kind of movies, but this, this person was actually watching a pornographic movie right beside me inside the church and during mass. And this person was not even trying to hide it. It was like trying to see how he could even get the attention of others seated beside him on the same seat. Some time ago, <laughs> I attended a mass, it was a wedding mass, and oh, really, I would encourage anyone getting married to ensure that the, the bridal train are properly dressed. The fact that you are getting married does not mean that you should go naked. You know, I was at a wedding mass some time ago, and there was this lady, she was practically naked, it wasn't bad enough that she was practically naked by, by what she was putting on, the few, uh, as in the few pieces of cloth on her body. But she kept walking up and down during the Mass. She would go to the front, go to the back, come to the middle. She just kept moving, moving. I, I was at the altar because I was a priest at this time. I was at the altar, and I could see that Whenever she got up, whenever she gets up to move, you could see the attention of people seated in the church. People were just following her up and down, up and down throughout that wedding. For me, this can only be the devil using people without they themselves even knowing that they are being used. Sometimes the devil can be in church and carry out spiritual attacks right in the house of God. Sometimes the devil comes to church to recruit more members in the name of friendship, which is often defined by immorality and so on. 
Jesus Christ said, by their fruits you shall know them. Be careful. It is not all that glitters that is gold. In the name of my church member, my church member, my church member, many have walked, walked into deep darkness and sold their souls to the devil. Many are in church, but only a few are genuine Christians. This is why God revealed to Isaiah, said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Isaiah 29, verse 13. Another reason why one who is possessed may come to church is, they say, darkness attracts lights. Such persons come to church seeking salvation and deliverance from their bondage. They know how bad they are, but they desire to be set free. This is why Jesus was not angry with the man himself. Rather, Jesus spoke directly to the demon, saying, Be silent! Come out of him! This was why Jesus went to that synagogue in the first place, to set at liberty those who were oppressed. If Jesus knew there were such persons and did not shy away from the synagogue, the fact that we know there are demoniacs amongst us should not discourage us. Don't be afraid of going to church just because you know that the devil can also go to church. When you hear of scandals breaking out in the church, when things begin to go viral on social media about this pastor, that priest, that bishop, and so on, don't allow such things to discourage you from going to church. Yes, we have sinners amongst us. We have demoniacs holding strategic positions in the church and society, but should you then throw away the baby and the bathwater? Remember the words of St. Paul. We are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Know this, therefore, two reasons why the devil may want to come to church. Number one, so that the church Will be destroyed, which is not possible. No wonder Jesus Christ said, On this rock I build my church, and the gates of darkness shall never prevail against it. So, despite the history of the church, despite the, the, the things that have happened, the devil can never prevail against Christ. And now, but the second reason, which is another reason why we should pay attention, is that the devil comes to church seeking deliverance. So some persons may be in church right now seeking healing, seeking deliverance. We must not push them away. And we ourselves should not run away from church because we know that there are persons who are in need of deliverance. We should make ourselves healers. We should try and bring these persons who know they are in darkness into the light. The third lesson we learned today, hardness of heart is a first sign of demonic possession. Hardness of heart is a first sign of demonic possession. Because some of us may be possessed and we don't even know that we are possessed. Yes, some persons may be in church and they don't even know. You know, that is another kind of possession. That you do things and you don't know why you are doing such things. Our responsorial psalm today contains a powerful message. Oh, that today you will listen to his voice, harden not your heart. They often say that a dog that will soon get lost, stop listening to the voice of the owner. Jesus also noted, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. John chapter 10 verse 27 to 28. The sheep of Jesus hear his voice. They come to tears over their sins and they repent. Of course, not those who assume they are holier than everyone else 
and that the message does not apply to them. One of the signs of demonic possession is that you feel that this message does not concern you. That is one sign. So if you hear God's word, it should lead you to tears, regardless of the position you hold in church. Do not have a hardened heart. Do not say, eh, 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 Father, tell them, tell them, tell who, who else are they going to tell if not me? Even me, who is preaching, I'm also preaching to myself. The message should touch me. The message should lead me to tears, should lead me to examine my conscience. It should lead me to repentance. The hardness, this hardness of heart expresses itself either in self-righteousness or in the form of despair. That is the feeling that no matter how I try, I can never amount to anything good. It gives up the struggle against sin and concludes that all hope is lost. Unlike the people of Nineveh who made frantic efforts to repent, as we saw in our first reading of last Sunday, those whose hearts are hardened do not bother to lift a finger. They are like stones. No matter how much water you pour on it, the stone cannot absorb it. Jesus told us, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. When we are neck deep in sin, the devil makes us believe that there can be no redemption. Our recurrent sinfulness becomes a form of demonic possession. And our refusal to come out of it due to our hardness of heart keeps us going deeper and deeper into evil. Today, as you hear this message, God calls you out of that vicious cycle. You cannot remain a slave forever. Jesus added, the slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. John chapter 8, 35 to 36. You are not a child of the devil. You are a child of God. You were not born like this. There was once upon a time when you were not committing that sin. You can still return to that state of grace. Embrace Jesus today and ask him, to deliver you. So don't think, don't say to yourself, there's no hope for me. If you are saying to yourself, there is no hope for you. If you think that you cannot do without sin, then perhaps you have fallen into despair, which is one of the sins against the Holy Spirit. You need to beg God today for forgiveness. And the fourth lesson we learn today is if you are not married, you shouldn't be having sex. If you want to get the full gist of St. Paul's message in today's second reading, read that of two Sundays ago and that of last Sunday. No doubt, we live in a time in history where immorality has become the order of the day. And St. Paul's words are ignored even by those who should be examples in our churches and the larger society. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you cannot hold your flesh, then get married and be faithful to your spouse. If God blesses you with children, don't kill them. Don't abort your child. Whatever pushed you to sex should cause you to take care of your children. If you are not ready for the responsibilities of marriage or having to take care of children, take your mind away from sex. You cannot eat your cake and have it. Stop watching pornography and stop being friends with people who are constantly pressuring you to have sex or who are continually talking or making jokes about sex. As an unmarried person, St. Paul says, your only concern should be about the affairs of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 32 to 34. Let me tell you a secret. By asking us to be holy in body and spirit, St. Paul is not placing a burden on us. 
Instead, it gives us the surest ticket to freedom and peace of mind. You need to read from verse 35 to the end. St. Paul says, I am saying this for your benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you. Having a boyfriend or a girlfriend, one that you are sleeping with but not married to, is not enjoyment. It is a heavy burden. It is self-punishment. It is misery and pain. It is a restraint to your spiritual growth and self-development. In verse 40, St. Paul says, In my judgment, she, that is the unmarried person, is happier if she remains as she is. Do not mind that St. Paul is using the feminine gender, but this refers to both male and female. You are happier if you remain as you are. You are happier if you are not in a sexual relationship. You will never find happiness doing something that is against the commandment of God. Because God who gave us this commandment desires our happiness above everything else. That is why he gave us the commandment. So we should not assume that we know better than God by disobeying God and still hope to find happiness. The same happiness we want God to bless us with. There is a great joy and peace in not being sexually involved with anyone when you are not married. This is the joy of celibacy and an enormous power comes with it. Only those who are faithfully keeping themselves can understand its bliss. Let us not forget that celibacy already existed in the Jewish religion. Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, St. Paul, and many others were celibates. Do not get into a relationship that will lead you into demonic possession. If you are not married, St. Paul says, and you desire to be happy, you desire to live a great and happy life, then avoid entering into any sexual relationship. If you feel that you cannot stay without sex, St. Paul says, please get married and take care of your children. And God will bless you for it. In conclusion, my dear friends, we must exercise our authority as Christians. Jesus did not teach like the scribes. Instead, he taught as one with authority. Jesus taught as God because he knew who he was. When we don't know who we are, we behave like slaves and we allow others to push us around. More still, when in the name of sexual pleasure or quest for material riches, we sell ourselves to the devil, we become so entangled in sin that our heart begins, becomes hardened and we feel hopeless. Do not remain in darkness. If you hear God speaking to your heart today, come out of that court. End that sinful relationship. Come out of that dungeon. Come out of that demonic possession. Let your life henceforth become a proclamation of God's kingdom. May God bless his words in our hearts. May God give us the grace to break whatever ties we may be having with the spirit of darkness and live as God's children. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down and remain with you all, both now and forever. Amen.